Welcome to episode 14 of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And last night I was at Trivia and there was a strange connection to Patty Wolf at the bar at Trivia. There was a team named Burt Higgins' Angels. Now, I suggest you Google Burt Higgins and a specific song, Key Largo, to figure out Patty's connection to that trivia group. By the way, I'm going to go next week and be like, listen, I know the famous chick from that video. Like, I know her. We're friends. And then Patty's going to have to come all the way to Brooklyn to come to trivia. Anyway, we'll get there. Very nice. Uh, Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And you know what else is 14, Joe? We are 14 days away from heading out west to the Breeders' Cup. Are we? Yeah. By the time the show comes out, we'll be 14 days. Okay. Yeah. Can't wait. We got spe- we got something real special planned for our Breeders' Cup show. Just stay mm. tuned. Welcome to another episode of Rail Talk. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel as we strive to keep bringing you consistent, honest, and transparent industry content. Rail Talk is sponsored, as always, by Facing Tipton. Shout out to everybody at Facing Tipton. You're almost done for the year. It's starting to wind down. Like it's the kind of job where it's just constant recycling of energy to try to get through the next sale, the next sale, the next sale. But Facing Tipton has a very dedicated, passionate team. So I'm sure that they make it fun. But I'm, I'm excited for you guys to get a little bit of a break, but not before. We've got the October yearling sale, the Kentucky October yearlings, which will be at Newtown Paddocks in Lexington from October 23rd through the 26th. Hey, that's next week. So get on down there and start looking at horses if you haven't done so already. Then, of course, we've got the Facing Tipton November Night of the Stars sale, November 7th. There were some supplements to that sale that I mentioned last week. So if you haven't looked at the catalog in a couple of weeks, go to FacingTipton.com and check them out. We can't wait to see Wonder Wheel parading through the ring at the, at the Night of the Stars and get that big round of applause that we all love so much. That's two days after the Breeders' Cup, uh, three days after the Breeders' Cup. The Breeders' Cup is the 3rd and the 4th. November 7th will be the November sale, but there's some other action still to come after that. The Mid-Atlantic December Mixed and Horses of Racing Age sale, which is December 5th. Also, the Saratoga. Saratoga's October sale the, with the weanlings and the broodmares is going on right now. I believe our old friend Brian DiDonato sold... The topper so far in terms of weanlings out of Dawn Lightning. So shout out to Brian. I don't know if he's a listener, but if so, we're proud of you, buddy. Um, and if not, we're still proud of you. And <laughs> spinning forward <laughs> to 2024, first major sale of the 2024 calendar is the Kentucky Winter Mixed Sale, which will be February 5th and 6th. But all eyes are on Lexington for those two marquee sales coming up next week. And then the November sale. Cannot wait to see all those star mares in the ring. Not a ton of news this week, so we're just going to do kind of like a rapid fire part in the interruption type of segment here with just some little, little news bits of the week because uh, we are going to talk to Brett Jones in a little bit and we're looking forward to that. But like I said, there's a little bit of a, a lull in, in terms of the racing action as we get ready for the Breeders' Cup now in amazingly less than three weeks. That's year went by fast, John. But the first one I wanted to talk about was Turf Paradise. And you know it's a slow week when I'm leading with Arizona racing. But if you are an Arizona horseman, this is, you know, this is your life. This is the most important thing in front of you right now. And I think every every track matters as much as our buddy John, who loves shuttering racetracks, doesn't think so. Uh, there's been a little bit of a back and forth going on um, between the Arizona horsemen and the the uh, the racing Arizona Racing Commission. Nobody covers this stuff better than our old friend T.D. Thornton over at the TDN. And, you know, he, 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 he uh, had a story last week where basically the the. Turf Paradise was going to be knocked down. The old owner sold the track. The wrecking ball was going to come for it. It was just going to be a developed property. But then a guy stepped in and said that he wanted to buy it and revive racing there. And it's just it, it it seems like less and less of a possibility as time goes on and some of the details are worked out because Turf Paradise is in such bad shape that they just they, they can't run right now. They need major, major upgrades. Like if you go through through you know some of the details in this story, it's like, you know, the the rail has has issues that could be dangerous if a horse were to crash into the rail. Like the grandstand obviously needs major reconstruction and it's just you, you can't 
run there right now. So the question is, we're going back and forth, the horsemen and the racing commission, as to whether or not this sale is going to actually go through and racing is going to continue there. And then if, even assuming that does happen, whether or not it's going to be the track is going to be ready to race horses in the next couple of months, because that seems unlikely at this point. But there was one there, there was one little a wrinkle that I wanted to, to mention that that TD brought up. And I, this is why I love TD because like he doesn't mince words like in his headlines. He did his week in review this past week. He goes, the week in review, HB, HBPA tries to derail Heisa in federal court, but also wants its help in Arizona. And ain't that how it goes with these anti-government types? It's like I was on food stamps and welfare and nobody ever helped me. Like that's that that's to me is, is the general attitude where it's like you're you're all about the, you know, the government getting out of your hair and, and you know getting out of your life until you need something, until you need somebody powerful to come in and help you, because that's what the Arizona HPPA is trying to do right now to get Heisen to come in and step in and expedite the process to where they can they can be racing again in the next couple of months. And I'm just going to read, read a quote here. Uh, I have a recommendation that maybe we ought to ask Heiser to come back in and take a look at the track to maybe get a step ahead of some of the delays that we're encountering now. If we get Heiser to send somebody in to look at the track, we can see what's going on, going to have to be done before anybody will be able to race, whether it be current owner, future owner or whatever. That That's a quote from Lloyd Yother, who is the president of the Arizona HBPA. John, I thought we didn't want the government in our business. I, you know, it, it, you summed it up very well, Joe. There's not really much, very much for me to, to say on this, on this story. I just I, I shook my head. I actually had to read the headline three times before I understood it because I was like, wait, this doesn't make any sense at all. They're they're suing on the one hand and on the other hand, they have their hand literally have their hand out saying, please, please help me. Um, it, it, was, it, it just blows my mind that 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 people can can do things like that. Okay. Um, that being said, I still really feel like that this isn't going to come to fruition that that mm -hmm. eventually cooler heads will prevail and, and they'll figure out that the land value is worth more um, than it is as a racetrack, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we've talked about this before about, you know, some of the racetracks just actually need to fall by the wayside. Um, and it looks like that's going to be the, the way of, of Arizona, um, you know, going forward. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think that there still should be, should be racing there, but I think all joking aside, I think what people want most is clarity. That if there is going to be no racing in Arizona going forward, OK, we've got to pick up our stakes and move to New Mexico or California. In some cases that won't be feasible for a lot of people. And it's going to it's going to be a, a, a real sad development. But I think right now they're kind of in limbo and they don't even know whether or not there's going to be racing there in the next couple of months. So hopefully that all gets sorted out. Uh, switching over to the, the stallion side, it's, I mentioned that we're going to talk to Brett Jones of Airdrie Stud in a little bit about some of the stallions that they have on their roster because it's the time of the year. And I used to always love this time of the year. When I was in I was in print where everybody's re releasing their stud fees one after another, you just got to keep doing those releases over and over again. But there are, you know, it's 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 interesting insofar as the top of the heap and to see, you know, who gets valued at the top, you know, uh, stud fee in the business. Two hundred fifty thousand is the magic number this year. We have three stallions who are going to be at that number and hard to argue with any of them into mischief. Obviously, over at Spendthrift, Gunrunner at Three Chimneys and Curlin at Hillendale. So those are the big those are the two hundred fifty thousand dollars stud fee horses. I think Tappet is still going to be at one eighty five or so. Warfront is a hundred thousand. That's that's a good value to me. Warfront only at a hundred k, relatively speaking. But John knows a little bit more about this side of the business than I do. Any of the stud fee announcements jump out to you? Well, I thought it was interesting that that first of all, that like Gunrunner is actually being reduced to two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, even though he's had such a good early career. And and I, and I think it's exactly what you said, Joe. It, it's coming back and trying to add value. Um, if they were, if Gunrunner was the lone horse above two hundred fifty thousand dollars, it does make people kind of sit up and say, "Well, should I go with that horse or should I go with something else that maybe is one level below, but I can, you know, get a." an equally nice yearling um, at, at the same price. Uh, the one thing that, that, that stood out to me this year, more so than other years, Joe, isn't stallions that were increasing. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned a couple of them uh, uh, that, that, that have gone up in price, uh, not this time, has gone up in price. Um, Constitution will probably go up in, in price a little bit, I would think. Nyquist went from 55 to 85,000. So, you know, some of the, some of the usual suspects that have progeny that are running in the Breeders Cup, um, you know, in a couple of weeks, um, they've definitely gone up in value. The thing that I thought was most interesting, though, is in the past, um, you would breed to a freshman sire and 
the farms would have a little bit of a scramble to try to get you to come back for the second year. And, and there's a lot of reasons why. Um, but this year in particular, because personally, because I think that this group of new sires from 2023 was so strong that the majority of farms took a step back and actually discounted those stud fees on those new stallions um, for 2024 for the horse's second year. So, for example, um, you have uh, Life is Good that's gone from 100 to 85,000. That's a 15% discount. Um, you see with, with Maxfield and Essential Quality over at, over at Darley John Abel. Um, and, and we can kind of go through the, the list of second year stallions. And usually they've held value, but I think the farms are getting ahead of the curve and saying, you know what, if you bred it to Life is Good for 100, it's a bargain at 85,000. And I would agree with that. Um, so why wouldn't you breed another mare to them? So I think they're trying to keep the quality of mares up at a certain level. And by offering a 10 or 15% discount off the freshman year, um, I, I think that's a really incentive incentivization for the breeders to do that. So um, it, I'm, I'm excited to see there's still a couple of farms that are going to be announcing. There's a couple of holdouts. Um, I think Lane's End is holding out Flight Line and Quality Road um, and, until they can make a bigger announcement. Ashford, I think, is just announcing their stuff tomorrow um, as far as which stud fees um, are going to be increased. Justify is, they've announced, is going to be doubled. From That's the one I wanted to bring up too. Like yeah. for Justify is going from 100,000 to 200,000. And that's interesting to me because of the kind of divergence that he and American Pharaoh have had. And American Pharaoh hasn't by, by any means been a failure, failure as a stallion, but Justify has just been an explosive success. And it just goes to show you the strength of that scat daddy line. Like scat daddy, man, we lost him way too early because his sons and his daughters, not only are they great on the track, but they're really, really productive in the breeding shed as well. So yeah, John, that was the one that jumped out to me. Justify going from a hundred to 200. Right. And, and, and again, no pun intended, you can justify it because he's had horses that have won graded stake races worldwide, worldwide. Um, and, and you talk about scat daddy and, and we can kind of divert onto this. You know, Joe, if you look at some of the top Euro stallions, they have scat daddy influences as well. So that, that's another topic for another show. But, mm -hmm. um, it, but it, you know, to me, it, it's farms are actually getting ahead of um, the problem of, of coming back and, and trying to get people, trying to get breeders to uh, bring their mares back. And I think it's because the po mare population is, is, has decreased and they need to come up with new ways to do it. A few years ago, they changed um, the way that you paid. It used to be live fall and now it's live fall stand and nurse for 30 days. So, you know, you get to hold on to your money. I think, I think that there's so much competition now for the breeding dollar that they have to come up with new ways to uh, incentivize people to come in. I do want to throw a shout out to, to, to one website that I use a lot um, that I think is really interesting. It's called pedigreegoddess.com. And the reason why I like pedigreegoddess.com is because the, the people behind the website update the website almost a couple of times a day. Um, as soon as there's an announcement of, uh, of, of a new stud fee, they immediately change it and they have it ranked by, um, you know, by, by uh, denomination. Um, and you can also go back and you can see what stallions stood for in previous years, 23, 22, that goes all the way back to 2012. Um, so, you know, I know they're not a sponsor, but I really like using um, Ann Peter's website, Pedigree Goddess, and I recommend it to, uh, to, to our listeners as well. And does a great job. You know who else does a great job is Arian Pedigrees. Arian Pedigrees, who is a sponsor, and I'm sure they have the stud fee information on there as well. So I just wanted to throw them uh, a quick plug. But, John, you know what it would make it easier for people to, to find mares to breed to? If stallions weren't breeding 250 mares a year in certain stallion stations. And that's, that's all. That's all I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yep. Again, another, another topic for another show, for sure. <laughs> yep. Real Talk is proudly sponsored by The Green Group. If you're not using The Green Group to help you with taxes, you're probably eh, definitely paying too much money in taxes. And today is a big day for Len Joe Synergy because it was today that Len Green got on a call with the West Point Partners to explain to them the tax implications of the horses they're buying and what to do for next year. And as you know, there's nobody better in the business, nobody even close, I don't think, in the business to land, to land in terms of being able to explain that stuff in a way that is digestible and makes a lot of sense intuitively. And that's because the Green Group has over 800 clients in the horse business. Len and Green and the Green Group are, have been owners for more than 40 years, have owned some of the top horses in racing and breeding. Uh, Len as a stallion produced 
a couple of pretty decent sons as well. Um, one of them is sitting right across from me on this show. Uh, but the Green Group knows two things better than most, the horse business and accounting. In the Venn diagram, they're pretty lonely right there in that middle middle cross section. And go see Len. Go see Len for a consultation. Give him a call. Go to greenco.com. Consultation with Len is a blast because not only is he going to teach you things, but he's also a leading voice in entrepreneurship. He taught at the Babson School. He's got a book called The Entrepreneur's Playbook that I'm sure LeBron James and you know, Mark Cuban and all these guys have read um, because Len is the king when it comes to entrepreneurship and accounting. He's owned over 30 successful businesses. It's like talking, it's like getting a mini NBA. NBA. See, now LeBron's on my mind, so I said NBA. Mini MBA talking to Len. And I can't wait to see Len at, at, on, the, on the flight to the Breeders' Cup. We're heading out to the Breeders' Cup in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a, a whole lot of fun. We appreciate him and everybody at the Green Group for everything they do. And I'm sure now, if they hadn't already, the West Point partners appreciate Len and the Green Group as well. Just go to greenco.com. Check them out. Tax season will be here before you know it. So we're so thrilled to bring this next guest to the Rail Talk family, to the Rail Talk stage, the vice president of Airdrie Stud, Brett Jones. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thank, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate we're it. We're so glad to have you. And, you, you know, you're one of the most interesting guys in the business to me. Just watching you from afar, it's nice to get to, know, to get to meet you and get to know you a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about Airdrie because I always find it interesting, uh, the stallion farms that can't necessarily compete, you know, in terms of, getting those top, 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 top horses like Cool Moore and, you know, Gainsway and these, you know, these stallion farms that have unlimited budgets, but you've carved out a really good niche for yourself in the business. Like we had a big, you had a big weekend for Cairo Prince, who's been one of your star stallions. Can you just talk a little bit about the process in terms of going after horses that you think will make good stallions that you're not going to get outbid by the Cool Moors of the world? Well, I, I appreciate that very much, Joe. And I, I think you've said it exactly right. We, we do have limited means. Uh, certainly, we can't come out and buy 100% of, of any of these really top horses um, because we're inevitably going to get outbid by, by guys that, that, that can swing a bigger bat. Um, so we have to be creative. We have to uh, find horses sometimes that, um, you know, we do it a couple of different ways. So, so recently, we've, we've, we've been lucky enough to secure Mage. Uh, that was a big-time deal. That was a horse that obviously every major stallion farm looked at, um, certainly expressed interest would, would be my feeling. Um, and that's a horse that we've uh, now are, are in the process of syndicating, putting this incredible syndicate together. Um, and I think that people are willing to invest with us because of, of what Airdrie has stood for over the years, that we do get behind these stallions, uh, some of which, you're right, are not the mainstream sort of uh, super sexy, uh, you know, stallions that, that everyone is going for, but, but we treat them all that way. And we go out and we, we support them with our own mares and we built the reputation. My father has built the reputation. Our team has built the reputation of, of kind of punching above our weight and having horses uh, succeed because of the, of the support that they get. And so now that history, I think has positioned us with, with a horse like Mage to make, come out with a, uh, a big time prospect and um, and do something that's a little different than what we've done. And, and, and people are following along with us, investing with us. And I think we've got a chance to make them very special. And, and Brett, without giving away the, the secret sauce, when does a mage come onto your radar? Is it when he breaks his maiden first time out? Is it when he runs uh, you know, a great race in the Florida Derby? When, when is he on your radar and, and you start actually reaching out to the, uh, to the powers that be that, uh, of the ownership? Well, like seemingly everyone in the industry now, we, we, we are friends with Ramiro. And uh, <laughs> so, 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 so when, when the horse broke his maiden, uh, it was on Pegasus Day. Everyone saw it. It was a good magic that uh, went seven furlongs, kind of ran off the screen on the lead. Super impressive. Uh, so that's when you start with the congratulatory text and calls, basically just because that's your friend and your friend just won uh, a big horse race. Um, but then as, as he developed and, and they got very aggressive with him, as, as you know, they, they threw him right into the, to the, to the, uh, Derby trail, right onto the Derby trail, um, which was ambitious, but it was ambitious because they thought they had a good horse. So we followed, followed him along. And, uh, and then of course, once he, the Florida Derby, that's when you start making calls on behalf of, of Airdrie stud, uh, when he runs that great second. Looked like he, he was actually going to win the race before Forte got 
got him just at the wire. Uh, and then, of course, when he wins the Kentucky Derby, you think in all probability it's he's going to be very tough to get. But this, these guys gave us a chance, and they um, they they were willing to partner with us. Um, and so, so something that seemed like uh, a bit of a dream uh, when he crossed the wire on the Kentucky Derby uh, at the Kentucky Derby has has now kind of come true for us. So it's um, it's pretty special. So how many horses are on your short list then when, when you when you see a mage, there must be, you know, other horses that win impressively first or second time out. Is it you start with 30 and you end up with one or is you start you're very selective. You start with five and end up with one. But what, what, what's the ratio? It, it's just it's totally dependent on on the year. I mean, it, it's you're, you're trying to find that horse that can be the right fit. that can be a realistic horse uh, to bring in. Uh, but but really, your list starts when you when you see that race that's sort of that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to use profanity, but but it's it's that it's that holy cow kind of moment um, when you see one do what he did on, on Pegasus Day, when you see one that wins that impressively, that moves like that, that that looks like they could be a real star, then then they're instantly on your radar. You follow them along and, and like any. Uh, you know what I always equate it to is is a college basketball coach. That the way that you you see a, a high school, you hear of a high school kid who's who, who's working his way up the ladder and and looks like could be a great recruit for you. So what do you do? You reach out to their family. Uh, you 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 show interest to the to the kid and and you you start sending letters. You start watching his basketball games. You start trying to do everything you can to get him into your program. Uh, and that is the that is the process that, that this takes when you're when you're chasing a stallion. By the way, feel free to use profanity on this show. I mean, don't <laughs> no, do I, it. I know, I know you guys are okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it if you don't want like your family, your friends to hear. It, but don't do don't not do it on our account. So that's just that's just one of the rules of the show. Um, but you mentioned you grew up in in the industry. I always wonder with, with people like you who have taken it and run with it the way that you have. You know, obviously it's easy to say now like you were always born to do this. But was there ever a point that you wanted to go do something else before coming back to racing and breeding? There, there really wasn't, Joe. I just, um, you know, I, when you grow up in, in Lexington, Kentucky, and and you've got Keeneland in your backyard, and and I, I just fell in love with it at a, at a very early age, and and going to the races, and really, you know, it it started in a couple of different places for me. It was it was going out into the to the fields with my dad when he'd take me out to to see the foals and just be, you know, I I, I recognize how insanely lucky I am to have grown up. At Airdrie, and and to be able to grow up in this, just I mean, I, I really think it's the most beautiful place on earth. Um, and so, with that backdrop, you're either going to fall in love with it, or you're going to run in a in a very different direction. And right. I and I fell in love with it. And yeah. and I would go to the races, and then I I developed a, a fairly early uh, gambling addiction <laughs> at probably about <laughs> the age of eleven. I think I've gotten past that now. I think it's in my rearview mirror. But that, but that's how it started was, was, was betting the horses and, and the excitement of the races and the excitement that comes with, with going to the track. And, and then of course, in, in Lexington, as you guys all know, it's, there's, there's no place more social or more fun than, than Keeneland race course. So, um, it was that combination and dad always said, you know, he, he, he never pushed me to be in the business and, and I'm thankful they didn't have to. Yeah. And, and, and your dad made such a, a huge imprint on the on the industry um, then and, and now and the way things are done and, and the way things should be done. Um, and, and I always enjoyed my, my time with him. Uh, you know, being that, that you're the next generation coming in, how difficult was it to kind of get out of his shadow and do things your own way? Yeah, there, there's that is when you when you go to work with your dad that that's part of it. Th- thankfully, that's a, that's a shadow that I I never had an issue with with being in because we because of the relationship we had. And that's another thing that can go, you know, one of two ways. Uh, that's not easy always to work with your dad, and it's another way that I recognize how lucky I've been. That we Brad, were, will you just just for my own sake, will you repeat that one line again? Uh, just just so I could tell my dad that, you know, <laughs> that it's not easy. It's not easy working for your father. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. Go ahead. Okay, Sorry. You're, you're good, buddy. But it, it's you, you. We were able to work together and it was it was very it was very obvious who, who, who the boss was and who, and who the listener was. And, and I and I was the listener. And, and as you grow up and you you do establish your own ideas and and dad would let me 
have those ideas. He would let me come with the stallion uh, and say, Pop, I think we really need to be looking at this. He might disagree. And and he was probably right. But uh, he did give me that that freedom and and that leash to, to, to make some of my own decisions. And uh, those decisions have, have successes and they also have consequences. And, and I got to live through those as well. And, and um, you know, it's again, it, it, it's, it's boring to talk about, but I just lucky is the right word. I just it was it was always easy for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he, he was a titan of this industry. And, and obviously, we're, we're very sorry for your loss to you and your family. I know it's 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 kind of a raw thing still because it only happened recently. But, you know, just what are some of the things that you think about with your dad? It doesn't even have to be racing related. It's just some of the things you think about with him that make you smile because it was just it was so nice seeing the outpouring of support from everybody in the industry and how many people he touched. But you yeah. personally, what are some of the things that, that give you the best memories? Well, it's it's it. You, you don't have enough time on on here to to hear the stories I've got, but it's uh, you know the, the dad dad obviously wore different hats. He he was in politics. He was he was a leader. He was um, you know so many people have used the word visionary, and it's it's the right word. Uh, but at the core, he just he loved horse racing, and he loved being on the farm. And so those are really the, the memories that, that I have, or as I said, going out in the field with dad, uh, winning a race. I mean, I can remember winning the, when, when our Philly won the Kentucky Oaks, uh, proud spell in 2008, I remember us literally seeing each other in the hallway because I'm superstitious enough where I, I run off by myself with my girlfriend at the time who I've, who I've since married, thankfully. Um, but uh, I went to one spot, he went to another spot, and I can still, you know, just even sitting here, I can still see the look on his face when we saw each other in the hallway and, and ran to each other, and you have that big hug. And, uh, and you know, th- those, those are the moments, those celebratory moments, and that's, that's the best part of our game. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's being able to share something like that with, with the people you love, and, and I was lucky to get to do it a, a more times than we than we probably should have been allowed to do with with that. The, the the best thing for me is going through the catalogs, Brad, and and mm-hmm. you find this is a Calumet family, this is uh, Ogden Phipps family, and and there is an Airdrie family. I mean, there's a family tree that comes through uh, on a lot of these pedigree pages, and they keep getting longer and longer as far as the number of stake winners. You guys have 58 mares and weanlings in the Keeneland November sale, including a, a, a weanling that's a half to Zandon. Um, what was that like? Because I think if you remember correctly, Zandon, isn't that like a third generation full for you guys? Or, or am I thinking of a different one? Yeah. Wit- witness post down there on the on the bottom of the page now you see was was a mare that uh, Bill Graves, uh, who was another legend uh, who passed passed too young. But but Bill uh advised dad to, to buy this gone west filly named witness post uh because witness post had an inordinate amount of talent but got hurt uh so she didn't get to show it and and bill knew that and and pushed dad towards her uh and it ended up she was not an expensive filly i think she brought uh just from memory 15 or sixteen thousand dollars um something like that and uh that whole page has just been built up around her that talent that she had she did have, you know, some some certain some back pedigree, but but she had that talent, and uh, and that talent has come through and in generation, and I and I love that that uh, is and hopefully will be recognized as an Airdrie family because we are trying to develop that. Uh, when you've got a tap at Philly out of a mare like that, it's awfully hard to sell because uh, you think of what she could be in the broodmare band someday. But we do have the Philly in the sale, and uh, and and we have to run this thing like a business, so. Um, uh, she she will be offered at some point in all in all probability uh, and hopefully and hopefully in November and and hopefully with a real good update for a uh, uh, a big Breeders Cup Classic performance by Zanda. It's a good segue into my next question, talking about running it like a business because it's I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier to make money in the breeding and stallion business than it is in the racing game. But that was one of the things I, I liked about your dad was that he did keep some homebreds to race, and it always made me take notice when I saw Brad and Jones in the owner of the, or the breeder line. What's the plan going forward now um, with you? You you know fully at the helm. Do you guys still want to keep that little bit of a racing division, or do you just want to focus mostly on racing and breeding? Or uh, excuse me, breeding. No, absolutely. There's not a whole lot, frankly, that has changed with with the model. Um, we we take our best horses to the sales. 
Uh, we offer them to everyone. We, we put a, what we think is a reasonable reserve. If we sell them, that's wonderful. We root for them and, and hope that they add to the pedigree page for both the mayors and the stallions. And, and if we don't get what we think is fair, then, then we'll race them. And we love racing. And, and I've, I've, I've inherited that from pop. Uh, we've, we've got that same racing bug and, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that, that's the most, those are the most fun Saturdays that you have is, is at the racetrack. And, uh, no, we, we always want to race because, um, because it, you know, I just, that's, that's, that, that's the best part of this game, obviously. Yep. 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 All right, Brett. So it's almost breeding season. People are clamoring to get seasons. Who is undervalued on the Airdrie roster that is going to be the next upstart or Gervin? Now, I, I said before we came on here, I said, I said, John, this doesn't have to be Airdrie plugs. We can talk about any, any, anything you want. No, no. I, well, but, all right. Then, but, then, I, then but, we'll, I, but I, but I appreciate, but I, but I sure do appreciate a plug. So let's, pl- let's plug away here. Right. So, so Brett, uh, I'll, fo- I'll follow it up with, and then, and then give me one that's not on your farm. How's that? No, well, I, I think that, um, <laughs> I, I really think with, with the way the roster is playing out right now, collected, at, at, and we're going to come out with our stud fee. He's going to be ten thousand. Um, we're, and we're going to be coming out with our stud fees tomorrow. We had a slight hold up for a, a different matter, but um, stud fees will come out tomorrow. And collected at ten thousand. When you look at a horse that has had just first crop three year olds, has already had three different horses that are Grade Two winners, uh, and those Grade Twos can become Grade Ones. Um, and and has had six overall stakes winners. That's a great body of work for a for a horse that you know that young. He's getting a little bit lost in the shuffle because of how incredibly strong uh, that sire crop is. So when when you look at the rankings and you look in there and you see uh, Good Magic and you see Justify and you see Bolt Dioro and thankfully you see Gervin, uh, uh, one of our horses. You know, that's a really, really tough group to compete in, but he's really, he's doing that. Six stakes winners, three of them grade two winners, and that city zip line as precocious as, as city zip was, so many of his horses have gotten better with age, and I think that's exactly what you're seeing with with the collected. So he is a horse that I would be long on uh, and, and that I think offers real value at, at 10000 I'm so glad you said collective because I wanted to plug a West Point horse, Northern Invader, who I'm <laughs> sure you're exactly right, Joe. And I, I should congratulate you as soon as I came on here, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, no, and he's he's a real nice one too. So we're really really excited about him. Uh, you know, another one that I really love is, is Upstart, and can you just he's he's one that I think has been like a slower burn, and he's starting to come on like a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Upstart and what stood out uh, to, to you from from him and his racing career? Yeah, I, I, he was, you know, when, when you talked earlier and you're very nice about horses that aren't super obvious, uh, Upstart was super obvious right up until about the Kentucky Derby. Um, if you look back at his races, what a top two-year-old, he's one of the best two-year-olds in the country. He placed in the in the Champagne, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, even though he was, you know, AP Indy line by Flatter. Flatter's an exceptional stallion, but you don't expect him to be super early. This horse was early. Uh, and then the races he was running at Gulfstream on the Triple Crown Trail were were as good as any horse on the on the East Coast. When he won the Holy Bull, he ran a very high number, uh, a very high buyer, a very low sheet number in the um, Florida Derby. Went second, uh, and but just never came back to that form. And after a uh, a year of not coming back and and having just an okay four year old. Uh, then, you know, as you say, the bloom was a little bit off the rose and, and you had to kind of remind people about just how talented he was. So that's, that's when we went for him. Uh, thankfully, we're able to get him as a stallion, hoping that what we saw in those early years were what he was. Uh, and I think, and I think it was because you're seeing now, you know, he started at just $10,000. He didn't win a grade one on the track. So he had to kind of make it the hard way. We certainly got behind them. Our partners got behind them. The syndicate, uh, we sold some shares and put a group together. Um, but now, in, and he has improved his mares so dramatically. If you if you look at the average earning index compared to the comp index, which is a, is a metric that we use a lot, because it, 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 it generally, if you think a horse is a good stallion, those numbers match up and they're, and they're, and they're on there. 
Uh, he has improved his mares, and now these last two years, with all the success he's had on the racetrack, now he's finally getting these quality mares at, at $30,000 books. And, and it's very, very exciting for us to think of what he can now do, now given the opportunity uh, of a really top stallion. And uh, I think he's, he's going to run with it. I just want a quick follow up and it's not even really a question, but it just must be so cool, you know, owning a stallion, running a stallion farm. They must all be like your babies, like all of the horses that are running that are by your stallions. You get to root for all of them. Like, how cool is that? That's exactly right. You get the you get the entries every day and and you have all these different rooting interests. And uh, we share that with the farm and we've got a text thread uh, with with our guys that, you know, every every from the one o'clock maiden to the five thirty stakes race. We're we're texting back and forth and getting all pumped up about about everything. And and again, that just that just makes it so much fun when you when you've got these rooting interests. And right. you know, there are days where it's not a lot of fun because they're not running very fast. But but when it when it goes right, there's nothing better. Yep. And 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 Brett, one of the things that I've enjoyed about our relationship is that you know I I consider you a, a genuine person. You genuinely want to help the industry. You genuinely want to make things better. Um, you're on a number of boards, and you were recently elected as a new member for the Jockey Club. What do you think is is going well right now in the industry, and what things do we need to improve on? Well, you always need to improve, and and you know that, and and. What is what is going right, and and not everyone will agree with me, but but I think finally establishing HISA. I know there have been growing pains, but to me that is a tremendous victory for the industry. And there are going to be growing pains, and there are going to be moments where we wish something was was handled differently. But to finally have everybody playing the same set of rules and knowing that the horse's best interest is being looked after by those rules. I don't know how that cannot be a, a, a major victory for the industry. Now, one of the things that's not going well is, is how we communicate that um, because we have not done as good a job as an industry as we should. And, and part of that is, is proper communication costs a lot of money. And I, I know that that's, I'm, I know you've talked about that on, on your show and, and finding ways to get that message out to make those funds available. And I do believe there are ways to do that. Uh, I just think marketing, marketing this thing, showing that, listen, we all know that we have had a very, very tough last few months, and, and we all know that. But showing people that progress is being made, that people do love these horses, that, that the people that work with them, it, it breaks us apart when, when things go wrong. Uh, showing, showing that side of the industry and, and showing people the, the work that's being done uh, is is what we have to do and and what we're trying, but 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 we're not succeeding to the extent that I think we should. That anyone thinks we should. Yeah. Yep. No, couldn't couldn't agree more. Uh, last question for me. I appreciate you coming on, spending some time with us. You, know, you mentioned growing up in the industry. This was something you always wanted to do. You've got young children. Yeah. You, you had any inclination yet, whether or not indication whether or not they are going to want to be in the business, or is it too soon? <laughs> well, I'll get. I'll give you. I'll give, I, I would take the same philosophy about it that, that my father had. I would never push him for a second because it doesn't work to push somebody into this business. It's they're either going to love it or they're going to do something else. And so I've not pushed them. And uh, I took all three. We have four children, three boys and, and a little girl, a little six month old girl now. Uh, but the boys we took to Keeneland the other day, we had two partnership fillies run uh, and they both ran very slowly. And so the boys had gone down in the in the paddock to to watch them, and and then they 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 bet on bet a couple dollars on them, and uh, and watched them run up the track, which is not the most fun. And uh, and then my wife said, "Okay, well, boys, do you want to go home?" And and two of them ran away with her, and and my guy Jack Jones said, "No, I want to stay here with Dad and watch the last couple of Keeneland." So if that's an indication, who knows? And and if he wants to. If he wants to get into it, that's great. But you never know. It, it's it's they, they you know, it, what what we do have is we've already started. They've already started having these memories at the farm. Um, and and one way or another, if they get into the business, I just hope that they uh, appreciate how lucky we are to, to have these memories out here that we do. All right. And, and my last question is this, the, the same one that I asked you about the Airdrie Stallions. Who are you breeding to that you feel like are, is value for 2024? Hmm. 
Well, I, uh, to be very honest, I have not, we have not done our matings yet for next year. So I, I don't know, I don't know the answer there. Uh, I, I will, I will, I will plug, uh, uh, a, a friend's horse because it was very good to me. Not not this time as a horse we were sick when we didn't get as a stallion because we really believed that he could keep on uh, that he that he you know had everything that it took and and obviously a lot of people saw that and uh, he he was the sire of, a, of an expensive yearling we sold this year so it's always what have you done for me lately and and he's done a lot for us lately so I'll uh, I'll, I'll plug my friends not this time. And TaylorMade, sponsor of Rail Talk. So thank you. <laughs> that's that's perfect opportunity to plug the sponsor. Hey, Brad, thanks so much for coming on and hanging out with us. We appreciate the time. And just let me say, like, you know, I've never met you face to face before. I've heard all the great things about you. You are a credit to your dad and your family and the industry. And we appreciate having you in this business. Man, that's, that's too kind, Joe. But I really appreciate you having me on here, man. I look forward to catching up. We got to get you out to the farm and and, and show you around. And uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun rooting, rooting for that collected here the next few months. Hell yeah, let's do it. All right, man. Rail Talk is sponsored by TaylorMade. You heard Brett Jones mention TaylorMade's Not This Time. Well, Not This Time, unsurprisingly, leads the TaylorMade Stallion roster heading into 2024. He will stand for $150,000 a pop in 2024, which sounds like a lot of money until you realize the success that Not This Time has had, not only on the racetrack, but in the auction ring as well. He has been a complete cash cow for TaylorMade, and they deserve it. You know, they have that connection with the family. They do a great job, not just in the sales, but in the stallion world as well. So they deserve a big time stallion like like him. And he really has provided a huge, huge boost to them and to the industry as a whole, because I love how his horses can run on dirt, turf, short, long. He's just one of those stallions that can do everything with his progeny. Want to run down the rest of the, the, the tailor-made roster for 2024 real quick. Nick's go will be standing at 15,000. Idol and Tacitus both at 10,000. And then they've got Instilled Regard, Instagram, and Row at 7,500 a piece rounding out the roster and you know they obviously are going to be very busy with the October sale and the November sale coming up at Facing Tipton and then we got the Keelan November sale that I'm sure they'll have a huge consignment for as well and they're also giving out sweet polos John how do I get me one of those uh, you got to sell a champion that's how you got to do it man there you go <laughs> you got to figure out how to put the logo on the screen so people I, can I, see I'm it not, I'm not just rubbing my nipple this now time. we got it. Like the logo this time Yep. Now we got it. So, so really, so I have to have a champion with TaylorMade to get that shirt. That is an that's, exclusive. That's the way, that's what I had to do. You may have an easier road to go because you're a better guy than I am. Um, and don't forget that Medallion Racing um, has a horse that's going to be running in the Breeders' Cup this year. Yeah, can't wait to see all the medallion partners out there and Mark and Duncan and all the TaylorMade team. I'm sure they're going to be well represented at the Breeders' Cup as well as in Lexington for those sales coming up. So we'll see you guys soon. Keep up the great work. If there's one thing we love more than talking spicy on this show, it's contests. We've had a lot of great contests already in the young history of this show. We've named two horses from contests so far. One change of Jamaica, who is my baby. And then Burner Account, who is Steph's baby. Steph won our contest to name. That was such a convoluted contest, but I think it worked out. This one is a much more straightforward contest. So we want to figure out how much, how, how well the audience knows myself. And my buddy John Green over here. Now, if you're a true fan, you might not know the answers to these immediately, but you'll know which ones feel right. You know, you, you, you'll, t- you'll, you'll go back into your knowledge bank and what do I know about Joe? What do I know about John? And I think you'll be able to, to suss these out, but they're not easy. So the, the, the gist of the game is we're going to give you 10 facts. I'm not going to tell you which one is me, which one is John. You write to us on Twitter or email at email conversation at railtalkmedia.com with your answers. Which one is Joe? Which one is John? And the winner, the one who gets the most right out of 10, is going to get the special prize or the punishment, depending on how you look at it, of sitting in on an episode of Rail Talk with us. So you'll be part of the live studio audience. You'll see all of the nonsense. See, you rail to, off the rails is a lot of the nonsense that goes on when recording these shows, but you'll get the front row seat to all of the nonsense. And trust me, there's more nonsense. And John can attest to that. And Patty can attest to that as well. So that's the prize. Hit us up. 
Email conversation at railtalkmedia.com. Tweet us your answers. And if you got the most right, you'll be able to sit in on next week's episode. I forgot to mention that. Next week. So time is of the essence. Get these answers in soon. Next week, our big Breeders' Cup preview show. You're going to be able to sit in with us, you know, maybe chime in from time to time with some criticism. Like, John, your hair parted a little bit weirdly today. So I think you need to go back into the dressing room and makeup and fix it. Or Joe, haven't I seen that shirt before? You're running out of clothes to wear on the show. But <laughs> no matter what, it's going to be a fun time. We always have a blast recording the show. I hope that comes through on the air. And you're going to be part of it if you can guess which of these facts is me or John. Let's get it started. Number one, I once, and this is just me, the general I. This is not me saying me, Joe, because obviously that would give it away. <laughs> Question, fact one, I once broke up with a girl in a Psych 101 lecture class. Number two, I ran the 100 meters in 10.2 seconds. Number three, I won an award for photography at a major museum's exhibit. Number four, my first job was in construction. Number five, I got a concussion in high school and was told to, quote, shake off the cobwebs and get back in the game. Number six, my favorite ice cream flavor is cookie dough. Number seven, I'm allergic to eggs. Number eight, I hit two home runs in my first Little League baseball game. Number nine, I was in the stadium when my favorite hockey team won the Stanley Cup. And number 10, I went zip lining in West Virginia. So those are the clues. It's not five and five. So, you know, it it could be any mixture of me and John. So you just got to figure out door number one or door number two. Send us the answers, conversation at railtalkmedia.com, or hit us up on Twitter. I'll never call it X, as long as I live. And give us your guesses, and then whoever does the best, come on next week and watch us record this, parentheses, shit show (laughs) of a podcast. And we can't wait to to welcome whoever it is. I think I know a couple of the favorites right off the jump, Um, but it's open to everybody. And can't wait to welcome y'all and show you how the sausage is made on the big Breeders' Cup preview show. John, are you excited? I am. I can't figure out even how many of those are me. So whoever came up with the with the facts really did their homework. I I was like, did did I do that or did Joe do that? I, I don't I don't honestly remember. So you know, it, it's I think if I did the contest, I'd probably get seven out of ten. How many do you think you get, Joe? I would hope you would get all the ones that are you, but you know, it's, I think your memory might be going a little bit. As I don't know. That was, that was, that was in a fogged haze. A lot of, a lot of those, <laughs> I think, I, I think I could see myself doing some of those, but I, I don't, you know, like little league was 50 years ago, literally. So I, I, I maybe did that. I love the 10.2 second hundred meter because that doesn't sound like either of us, you know, that's true. You were you driving, like were you driving when you did that? Use your car in your Camaro. Oh, you don't drive. That's right. That's you can't right. Even- <laughs> ride my bike that fast. I think that's about uh, it. But yeah, yeah, no, Usain Bolt was not the secret co-host one of these times. That is true about either Joe or John. So we'll reveal and, the and answer. None, none of these, none of these were Brian DiDonato either. So it wasn't Brian didn't run in 10 to Brian didn't hit two home runs as a, he, his favorite ice cream may be cookie dough, but it's don't put Brian down. It's an automatic loss. How about Brian getting two shout outs on the show after we haven't spoken about him in years, probably, but it's, it's, it's deserved. The, the ban is deserved. over. The, the ban is over. It's been, it's been, it's been 13 and a half shows. So we can talk about him now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's, uh, that, that, those are a lot of, a lot of very, very interesting tidbits about us. And we will reveal the answers next week i guess next week once we've picked the winner we'll reveal the answers on next week's show i'm so glad i got through this whole thing and remembered how the contest works <laughs> this time because that's always the first hurdle when we do those contests does joe remember what we right. talked about and what how the contest works but it, i do i did it did i do <laughs> joe can i can i say one more thing it has nothing to do with the contest but it's sure. very appropriate yes. so so we were able to use the name bury the lead on a two-year-old that we have, it's a central banker two-year-old. It's a New York bread, so it'll be running up here in New York. And I thought it was very appropriate that we announced it at the end of the show because we definitely buried that lead. Now the question is: John is a journalism school graduate. That's not one of the. That's not one of the facts, right? 
No. Okay. No, just, just like, like minor, like minor, <laughs> minor in mayhem. I forget what Patty wrote. I minored in something anyway. And nonsense. Uh, nonsense. Nonsense. I, I did. Yeah, I did so wait, nonsense. so did you use the correct spelling of lead? Yes. And, and, and it's B U R Y space T H E space L E D. Did it. Yeah. yeah. Do you know you why, it. you know why it was spelled that way? Why? I had to look it up. So basically, because if they had it bury the lead, they also at the time were using lead in their printing. So they couldn't say bury the le- lead because it was also spelled the same way as lead. So they changed it to L-E-D-E. Wow. That, that should be one of the fun facts for the contest. Yeah, the, the, John knows. No, I mean, I was about to say, John, you are you pay a lot more attention in journalism school than I do, but. And he said he just looked it up. So anybody could do that. I looked it up. <laughs> Siri, how do you spell bury the lead? <laughs> right, well, I, knew how many it was. I knew how many letters it was before Siri told me. This is, this is, this is, this is unraveling quickly. But anyway, get those <laughs> answers in and we'll see you next week. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode of Rail Talk. Please, someone do something interesting news wise next week. So we have something to talk about for when we have the winner of our contest. Sit in on the show and watch the magic happen we can't wait for that get those answers in and we'll pick a lucky winner next week thank you to john green for as always for being my co-pilot here thank you to our producer patty wolf our associate producers anthony laraca Aliyah laraca and nathan wilkinson shout out to brett jones as well for stopping by i really enjoyed talking to brett and as always thanks most of all to you the viewers and the listeners for tuning in to us we'll see you back here next week on rail talk